I'm Christy Lockhart. I'm the Assistant Director for the Thomas Crane Public Library, and I'm happy to welcome everyone to tonight's program. I'm very excited to introduce tonight's guest, the traveling librarian, Jeffrey Clates. Thanks, Christy. Um, Christy and I used to work together um, at the library where I am currently the head of reference services, at least for another month. I'm um, planning to retire later this fall. So um, that will give me an opportunity to do even more traveling. Um, but um, I'd like to welcome you tonight. And um, I tend to run my programs very informally. And since we have a small group tonight, um, I certainly would um, encourage those of you to, uh, if you have any questions or comments along the way, do feel free um, to either unmute yourself and just interrupt me. Um, or uh, if you don't have a microphone, I see someone doesn't have a mic, do feel free to also pop that in the chat. Um, that's fine um, as well. And I can answer questions along the way. Um, that doesn't work quite so well with a large group, but we're small tonight. So uh, I'm happy to do this as informally as, as we want to be. Um, whoops, I see another couple of people coming in. There we go. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see um, the first of my slides. Does that look good? Looks good. Good, okay, great. So we will get started. Um, this is a trip that I did uh, a few years ago. I've been to Istanbul more than once um, and it has changed quite a bit um, in recent years because a lot of the politics um, has been changing things, but um, I'll be pointing out some of that as we go along. Uh, first, I want to put Istanbul on the map. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether any of you have actually been there before, but uh, if you have, again, uh, do feel free to pop in and chime in with any comments that you have about it. Uh, but I want to kind of put it in the context of uh, the region that it's in and the country. Turkey um, is over 75 million people now. It's a very large country, overwhelmingly Muslim, most of whom are Sunnis. And uh, Istanbul is about 14 million of those people. So it's a very large um, city and metro area, although it's not the actual administrative capital. Um, that's Ankara. Um, but uh, Istanbul is certainly the big tourist capital. It's also the big trade capital and the big financial capital. It has a very long history, which I won't go into in too much detail right now, um, just because it would take us all night to do that. Um, but I do want to give you the kind of the 60 second tour. Um, it is one of the largest cities in the world, believe it or not, in terms of the city proper. Um, but um, the metro area spreads uh, all over the, the peninsulas on either side of it, in between the Sea of Azov and the, and the Black Sea. Um, it was founded originally in the 7th century BC um, as Byzantium, which you probably know. And then in the 4th century AD, um, it was changed, the name was changed to Constantinople when uh, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, made it the eastern capital of the Roman Empire. The next big date that was very important was 1453 um, when the Turks conquered it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go along as well. And then it remained in Turkish hands until the fall of the Ottoman Empire brought independence in 1922 after um, Turkey, which at that point was, or the Ottoman Empire which was kind of at that point known as the, the old man of Europe, um, disintegrated after World War I. And Kemal Ataturk um, ushered in the 20th century modern era of independence in 1922. Ankara is, as I said, the capital. That's got about 2 million people. So it's a big city, but much, much smaller um, than Istanbul. The location um, is very important. Actually, whoops bring up my pointer here. Um, the location, of course, today as throughout history has been incredibly important because it lies um, at this boundary here on uh, the Bosphorus Straits. Here's the Bosphorus, here are the Dardanelles leading from the Black Sea um, and through the Sea of Azov into the Mediterranean. Um, and that, of course, has been a very important place because it straddles Europe and Asia, um, two very different cultural um, uh, worlds, and also um, it connects Russia 
and Ukraine and a number of other important black seaports um, to the rest of the world, which has been very important uh, throughout history. Um, up until recently, it was actually the fifth most visited city anywhere in the world for tourists. That has changed quite a bit in recent years. Um, COVID obviously has made a difference to that, um, uh, affecting travel everywhere. But also, um, even before that, there were a couple of um, unpleasant uh, terrorist attacks that happened in Istanbul, which significantly uh, impacted their uh, tourism. This is just zooming in a little bit more where you can see um, more closely where the city itself is. And if I zoom in completely, we're going to focus tonight mostly on this central area in here, which is the historic part of the city. Um, the original city walls um, follow kind of more or less along this area here. And the oldest part of Istanbul is separated from the newer city by the Golden Horn this little stretch along here. And um, this, the modern city, of course, has grown uh, all over the area. Most of the historic sites that you might wanna see are in this peninsula right, um, where the Bosphorus and the Golden Horn meet each other. We're gonna, most of the things that we're going to look at this evening are, are there. Um, the last time I was there, we stayed in a nice little hotel, which was, um, very conveniently located to a lot of these cities. You can, uh, the downtown sites, you can see it's, um, this is not a big modern American city. It is full of nooks and crannies. It's full of uh, narrow little lanes. There's a lot of pedestrian areas. Um, and uh, it's a great city for walking. Um, I'll just tease you a little bit with some beautiful sights at night. Um, it's a remarkably safe city also, if you're curious, that, that often comes up. Um, it's it's a, probably the most Western of the Eastern cities and it's the most Eastern of the Western cities. So it's, and it's been that way for years, um, but it's also an incredibly tourist dependent city. Um, so you will find that uh, the people who live and work there speak multiple languages uh, English is widely spoken because it's sort of the lingua franca of all of the different tourists that tend to go there. So no matter which shop you go to, if it's a candy shop like this, or a bakery, or a museum, you're going to find English widely spoken. Um, and the tourist infrastructure is uh, extensive the same way you would find in any other major European city. Um, we stayed in, here I am, um, I'm being silly in this picture, but um, we stayed in this nice little hotel that was very comfortable, not very expensive, and had the most over-the-top front lobby I've seen um, with furniture like this. Um, but it was in a really nice neighborhood um, where this is literally, if you come right out the front door of our hotel, you turn around the corner and you can see Hagia Sophia um, just a couple of blocks away, which is probably one of the most important sites in the entire city. Um, on the right is a little um, fountain uh, there are old fountains throughout the city. Um, it's architecturally beautiful, which is very uh, enjoyable for me because I was an architecture history student in my undergraduate days. Um, so I tend to focus on a lot of that when I travel. The built environment is very important to me. Um, and we'll start with Hagia Sophia because that is um, probably the single most important thing to see there. If you were in Istanbul for only a couple of hours, this is the one thing you should see. It was built by um, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian in the year 537 uh, AD, and it served as a Greek Orthodox Church until 1453, which was that fateful year when the Ottoman Empire, uh, when the, uh, the Ottomans uh, came in and conquered the city under Mehmet the Conqueror, who um, amazingly was only 21 years old when he, when he did that. Um, and from then until uh, the, the 20th century in the early 1930s, it remained a mosque. Um, and that's why you can see the minarets um, at the corners. And it was turned in the 1930s into a secular museum um, with the evidence of both its Christian and its Muslim past. Um, but in a very controversial move in the past year or so, um, uh, the current President of Turkey, uh, Recep uh, Erdogan, 
made a very controversial decision to reconvert it into a mosque, which upset the international community. It actually even upset a lot of people within Turkey who saw um, this monument as uh, a sign of a symbol of modern Turkey's um, opening up to the rest of the world. Um, and Erdogan has caused a lot of problems um, because of his increasingly um, authoritarian and uh, conservative turning government, which has caused problems both with other countries and also with many of his own Turkish citizens. Um, but so uh, that does not mean that you cannot visit it. It is still uh, probably the single, as I said, the single most popular site to visit. So whether you're Muslim or not, um, you can uh, enter the building and uh, view it as you always have. Um, but it is now officially a mosque rather than uh, a secular monument, cultural monument. It's architecturally just the most incredibly stunning building. Um, and part of that is because you can see these many layers of history um, from back when it was a Byzantine church and through all the different periods of decoration, which include marble, fake marble, um, ironically, I, I found this kind of amusing that um, all of these people were far more interested in taking the photograph of the cat than in actually looking at the incredible architecture around them, um, which is just stunning. Um, it is probably the single most important Byzantine building anywhere in the world. Um, many of the original mosque, um, although some of them have been uncovered since then, and of course, minarets were added, as I mentioned, um, on the exterior. But even so, um, it's, it's just an unbelievable space to be in. It's hard not to be emotionally moved um, by this building, which has survived for so long and through so many different political um, periods. On the exterior, you'll see a lot of domes and half domes, which kind of hold the building up. Um, and on the interior, you'll see a lot of iconography that is both Muslim and also Christian. Um, much of what you're seeing is actually mosaics, some of which is gold. Um, some of what you're seeing is painted, not actual marble, but um, faux marble. And of course, there are um, all kinds of uh, Arabic uh, writing in, in various places around. And uh, here's actually a good place where you can see, um, um, now I'm forgetting what it's called, the mihrab, where uh, Muslims would pray in a particular direction and they have the equivalent of what would serve as a Christian pulpit um, where the imam would, would speak to his congregation. But there's huge... Um, amounts of detail, all these incredible uh, details that include ceramics, carved marble. Um, you can see it's still, um, for many years, it's been under renovations because you can imagine how difficult it is to keep safe a building that is in, after all, a major earthquake zone um, to, to try to protect it as much as possible. Um, here are some more. Um, what, what you're looking at here is actually more um, fake marble. This is not actual real marble, but walls that have been painted to look like marble. A very important place um, on the second floor. And you can you can wander around most of the building. Um, this is the call, called the Veisis mosaic, which is very early from uh, the 13th century, and it commemorates the return to the Orthodox faith. Because um, in addition to being the mosque and a Byzantine Orthodox church, there was a very brief period, um, only 10 or 20 years, when it was actually used uh, as a Roman Catholic church. And when it was returned to the Orthodox faith um, in 1261, um, this mosaic was added that shows the Virgin Mary and uh, John the Baptist with Christ in the center. Unfortunately, despite um, how much of it has, uh, is no longer there, um, it's still in actual superb condition. It's, it's important to emphasize that this is not painting. These are mosaics. 
um, and they're really in, in the parts that still exist are in superb condition. If you look out from the second floor, you can see over the, uh, the domed complex over to the Blue Mosque, which we're going to visit um, shortly, another of the major monuments of the city. Um, but you can see here just how big this place is. It, it is really quite huge. And it occupies a very prominent place in the center of the city, um, right in the middle of the, the probably the most historic district. So there are uh, old buildings all around it um, and hotels and restaurants and, and marketplaces and so forth. This is uh, a view of the outside, which seems kind of un, uninteresting. Um, most of what makes it um, a dramatic building is, is walking through this pretty unassuming exterior um, and seeing just how elaborately decorated it is inside. On the, uh, on the terraces just outside, it also are the tombs of several of the important sultans. This is on the south side of the building. Um, each of these is a, is a separate building that's designed specifically as a tomb for a royal family. Um, one of the sultan, each, each one has a sultan and his associated family members. Um, and you can see green as an important color in the, in the Islamic faith. So um, it's often used in buildings, but also as a covering for tombs. And you can see each one of these would be, here's the Sultan. This would be probably um, his wife or his primary wife and his children as well. Um, and I found this amusing. I, I we all do different jobs in our lives and it's i'm always fascinated to find out what other people do for a living and here's someone who spends his days vacuuming the tombs of the sultans because they have to be um, someone has to do um in the middle of this is the blue mosque as i say which is right across the park there is this beautiful park public area in between the two which makes for uh, a really nice assemblage of some of the most important buildings in the city. Um, and bear in mind, we're only a few, few blocks from the water also, which is kind of nice. Um, but a view, if you stand in the middle, you can see the um, Hagia Sophia in this direction. And then if you turn around, the Blue Mosque is immediately facing it just across the way. Um, I think it's worth pointing out just how cosmopolitan Istanbul is also. As I said, it's a very Western city in many ways, um, despite the, um, the changes that are happening in, in Turkey overall. Um, it's been a very busy tourist city for, for decades, and you'll find an incredible mix of street life there, which includes everything from now, um, the people you're seeing in this photograph are actually a single family. This is a Turkish man and his, his young daughter and his wife um, holding an ice cream, which they just got from the, the little street vendor, um, who is um, completely covered head to toe. But you will, five minutes later, see uh, a much more secular Turkish woman walking down the street in high heels and the kind of outfit that you might expect to see in any modern American city. Um, and a variety of, of different levels of observance in between. And that's true for the men as well, although it's much more noticeable with the women because their, um, their degree of observancy is much more obvious because of what they wear. Um, but you will see uh, a huge variety of uh, observance and tolerance for different levels of observance in the city. Um, looking across uh, the Golden Horn, we're going to visit that tower and the area across, which is a more modern 19th, 20th century part of the city. Um, it is, as I said, an incredibly touristy place, so you will find plenty of Turkish tourist junk. Um, if you need a magic lamp, here's where you can go and get one. Um, but it's a terrific city to stroll around, and in fact, I would recommend that um, as opposed to other ways of getting around. Definitely do not drive in Istanbul. You'd have to be um, insane to do that, and it would take you forever to get anywhere. Um, you can see in this picture, there is actually a very good public transit system. Uh, Istanbul has a metro. In fact, they have the only metro system on the planet that connects two different continents. You can actually go from a uh, metro stop in 
Europe and take it across the river or under the river and have lunch in Asia and come back again. Um, but there's also a very extensive bus and tram system, which is a good way to go longer distances in the city. But for most of what um, the average visitor would be likely to, to want to see, they're all within very convenient walking distance. And actually walking is one of the most enjoyable ways um, to experience the city, I think. Um, you may have heard, if you've read any uh, history of uh, Turkey or World War I or, or that time period, that for a long time, the phrase used to describe the Turkish government was la porte sublime, the sublime port, back when uh, France was a very powerful influence in this area and also when French, uh, the French language tended to dominate the um, political world. And so uh, it was the euphemism for describing the Turkish government. Um, and this is actually what it was referring to. This gate um, was the entrance to the Ottoman government back as far as Suleiman the Magnificent, who was probably the single most important and powerful ruler during the Ottoman period back in the 16th century. And so for many, many um, decades and, and centuries, um, it referred the, the term for this gate was used to refer to the, uh, the Turkish government in general, the Ottoman government. Nowadays, um, it's just kind of on a side street in, in the downtown of the city, um, and it gives access to the um, offices of the governor of Istanbul, the municipal government. Um, here is some typical Ottoman architecture. There's a lot of very uh, old wooden architecture, which you might be surprised expecting to see more stone buildings, but a lot of what's um, in downtown Istanbul is this very interesting old um, wooden, bu wooden buildings with balconies that help keep the buildings cool and hang out over the water. Um, I'll show you some more in a little bit. Um, a very interesting thing that many people miss because you'd have to know it was there um, is completely underground. and It's only about a block from Hagia Sophia. Um, it's the known as the Basilica Cistern, and it was built by Justinian, um, again, the same emperor who, uh, who built Hagia Sophia. And it is the largest of um, a great many cisterns in, in Istanbul that were designed to um, hold water to supply the city in general, but particularly in times of siege or warfare. This particular one um, is by far the largest and it holds 2.8 million cubic feet of water. Um, obviously nowadays it is not used for that purpose anymore and they've turned it into an attraction where you can go underground. Um, you can even dress up as a sultan and get your picture taken if you want to do that sort of thing. Um, but far more important is just to wander around this huge, absolutely gargantuan thing that is literally right under the city streets and you never know it was there. Um, they have it lit up. Um, there's only about mm, four or five feet of water now. Originally, it would have been designed so that the level of water would go all the way up to the sea level. But it's a fascinating place to wander around. Um, some of it was constructed even uh, like the heads that you can see here. Um, are used as bases for the columns. These were Medusa heads from old Roman buildings back when the Romans were, were in this part of the world. And the, there's some very beautiful architecture um, for something that was essentially just an entirely utilitarian um, water storage facility. But um, if you go there, it's, it's well worth visiting. Back above ground, um, you'll find um, an interesting park right above it. This is a 3,500-year-old obelisk that looks Egyptian because it is. It was brought from Karnak in the 4th century as a tribute to Constantine. And um, there you can see it better up there. The, the plaza that it's in here, um, you can see another nice uh, Ottoman-style building in the background. This very long, skinny plaza um, looks a little bit like an old uh, hippodrome, which is exactly what it was. Um, it has a long, narrow shape, and it's rounded at one end because this would have been during the Roman period where they would have had um, chariot races and other kinds of sporting events. So that um, the original is long since gone, but the shape of it still exists in the center of the city. 
And now it's just a beautiful public park where you'll see a lot of the daily life of Istanbul going by. And again, it's, um, I find one of the nicest things to do is just to stroll around and see how um, the Istanbuli live. Some of the buildings in the neighborhoods are very nicely restored. Many of these have been turned into very pleasant guest houses. Um, and if you go there, I would certainly advocate staying in one of those um, over one of the big international tourist hotels that don't really have any character. And many of those are actually quite far from the center of the city. So if you have the opportunity, um, treat yourself to one of these pleasant um, neighborhoods, because as I said, it's, it's perfectly safe. There's much more atmosphere. You'll be near all of the nice restaurants and shops. Um, and you may very well end up with a room full of antiques. And you'll be only a few minutes away from um, strolling down to see the Bosphorus with every, all the shipping going by. Um, this is looking across the river to the more modern side of the city. You can see the shipping port on the other side. Um, I thought this was a very interesting art installation, which is why I took this sort of artsy photograph. Um, and then I discovered it was just a bunch of guys um, shooting rifles at it for target practice. Um, but it was, I thought it was pretty anyway. And you'll find people fishing along here as well. Um, but I want to take you to next to the other big monument that people visit, the Blue Mosque, which uh, is officially known as the Sultan Ahmet Mosque uh, for its builder. Um, and like many of the other biggest um, architectural monuments in the city, it was built in the 1600s. Um, it has six minarets, which was considered very improper at the time because that's what Mecca had, um, Mecca being the most important uh, location in the Islamic world. And so for the Sultan to build um, an elaborate mosque that had one more minaret than in Mecca was considered the height of arrogance. Um, so what he did instead of tearing down one of his um, offending minarets is he built a seventh minaret in Mecca um, so that he could get around the, um, the fuss. Inside, um, it's just an incredibly spectacular building, but as you can see, it's spectacular in a completely different way from Hagia Sophia, because this was built as a mosque, never served any other purpose as a mosque. So unlike Hagia Sophia, which was um, an important building in different religions, um, this has always been um, a mosque and um, was designed with a very um, consistent uh, design theme, and much of it is blue. Uh, the entire interior that you're seeing here is not painted and not mosaic. It is, in fact, ceramic tile. There are um, something like 20,000 tiles in this gigantic building, um, which was designed by a protege of the great architect from that time period, Sinan. We're going to see a little bit more of him later. And the, the effect is really quite awe-inspiring. Um, not to mention the fact that it's just a monumental building. Each one of the four columns that holds up the main dome is, you can see how large it is by uh, looking at how many, uh, looking at the people standing around it. And like other mosques um, in Istanbul, it is, it is um, permitted for non-Muslims to enter. The only thing is that you can't go in during services um, there are various prayer times during the day when the mosque would be closed to non-Muslims. And it is also considered, um, despite the two guys that you see sitting here um, again, <laughs> against the column, it is considered um, inappropriate to dress casually. Um, and women would certainly have to wear a headscarf, um, regardless of what culture you're from. And you have to take off your shoes. But... Um, Turkey is one of the countries, one of the Muslim countries in the world that is more open about allowing visitors uh, who are not Muslim to enter mosques. If you get close up, you can see a little bit more of just how incredibly detailed some of these tiles are. Um, and they're still made. Um, these obviously are uh, very historic. They go back centuries. 
um, but the same style of tiles um, are being um, crafted today in Turkey and you can buy them all over the place um, as decor for your own house. Um, oh, I only took this photo because it made me think um, <laughs> it was kind of a bad Italian accent. Please do not leave it here in your plastic bag. Um, again, some interesting sites along the, uh, the road. You can see a wide variety of different kinds of people on the street. Um, Turkey has some great food. Um, it's an interesting mix of the kind of food that you would expect given its geography. So um, it's Eastern Mediterranean, but it also has influences from Armenia and Iran and um, Syria. Um, Greece, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of food that come together and all of the Eastern Mediterranean cultures have influenced each other. Um, there's um, both meat and vegetarian food, really great breads and stews, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and countless restaurants that you can enjoy them in. Um, this was one that we ate in a few times and got a really nice uh, view of watching the street traffic go by while we were eating. Um, this is just a, one of the lesser mosques, not one of the ones that people tend to visit, but um, one of many throughout the city. Um, and this was, we stopped in here just because it was on the way um, to the Grand Bazaar, which we're gonna visit shortly. Um, this is a view from the terrace of our hotel where we were eating breakfast. Um, the third major attraction, if you're only in the city for a short period, is the Topkapi Palace, which was for about 400 years from roughly the 15th to the 19th century was the, the Sultan's Palace um, and also the seat of government. Um, it has now been turned into an incredible uh, complex of museums um, that do an excellent job explaining about the history of the government, the history of the Sultanate, um, and they have spectacular collections of um, art and decorative arts. It's designed kind of in a, you work your way through several different courtyards. This is the entrance to the second of the courtyards. It's called the Gate of Salutation. And just to give you a rough idea, that's um, the image I just showed you is about here. Um, but you would enter through the main gate, work your way through um, progressively more um, private and intimate courtyards where um, eventually when you get to the center, only the Sultan and his, um, his uh, close family members and the people who serve them would be allowed to visit. Um, this area over here is the harem. And of course, then there's all kinds of kitchens and public rooms and state rooms around. Um, but most of the government activities would have occurred closer to the main entrance. Um, and in fact, here you can see this is the Tower of the Divan, which is where the Imperial Council of the Sultan was held. You could easily spend at least a minimum of half a day there and probably more, uh, depending on how much the different aspects of it interest you. There are several museums um, as part of the complex. And um, as you can imagine, because it was a palace for the Sultans, it's incredibly elaborately decorated with the same kinds of beautiful tile work, um, paintings, mosaics, um, and just incredible architecture. This is the audience chamber, which was also built in the 16th century. And this is where the Sultan would have greeted emissaries from foreign countries. Um, usually they would have come presenting gifts and making treaties and, and so forth. And this is the place where that would have those um, interactions would have taken place. There's also a library, which was built a little bit later where documents from the archives of the Sultanate were stored. And you can freely walk around most of the complex um, and visit the different museums. And when you get to the very end, um, down by the water, because this is right on the point, there's, it's actually quite high up and you get a a really nice view out over the Bosphorus where you can see all the traffic um, 
incredible amounts of shipping traffic going back and forth. Um, at the very end, oh, actually, before I go on, you can see there's a bridge up in the back of this, which is a more recent bridge. Um, and this is uh, the only bridge, at least at this point, they're considering another one. Um, it's the only bridge right now that crosses the Bosphorus between Europe and Asia, um, a few kilometers north of the downtown. Um, there are some later buildings that were built in the 18th and 19th centuries, like this one, um, that were used for other aspects of the, the Sultan's family. Um, this was a, uh, actually, is it this one? No, this building. Um, this was the Sultan's ice cream pavilion where when it was extremely hot. The family would go and sit in under these cool overhangs and enjoy the breezes off the water um, and eat sweets. Um, there's even this incredible um, bath area, um, which is now, um, if it's filled with anything, is filled with water. Um, but at the time, um, back in the 16th, 17th century, um, this was sometimes filled with milk, which um, the women of the harem were encouraged to bathe in um, for the, whoops, sorry about that, um, which were, um, they were encouraged to bathe in that because it was considered to be good for your skin. Um, what it wasn't good for was um, it just isn't a very good idea to put um, thousands of gallons of dairy products out in the hot sun in the middle of Turkey. Um, but they don't do that anymore, needless to say. Um, but being the sultan, he picked the best property, um, best real estate in the whole city. So you can look um, in pretty much every direction from the palace and so you see every other part of the city, north, south, and east. You can also get nice views of a number of the other mosques um, that are across the way. If you go, um, even if you don't go to a lot of the other museums, the one thing that you absolutely um, have to do um, is visit the harem, um, which is a separate ticket um, to get into that part of it. And, um, it's probably the most interesting, I think, of all the parts of, of the palace. Um, with the possible exception, I think, of the kitchens. Um, the palace kitchens, which you can see here, each one of those little smokestacky looking things um, is uh, a separate kitchen that was used to cook certain kind, a particular kind of food. And there was a uh, recent renovation in the last 10 years or so that completely redid this part of the complex, uh, restored it and um, redid all of the exhibits. So if you kind of like the, the upstairs downstairs aspect of this kind of life or, or want to see what, um, what was involved in making such an, an incredible place run behind the scenes, um, it's a great place to visit. You can see menus and um, how they serve the meals for literally thousands of people who live there. It's, uh, it's really quite fascinating. Um, you can also visit the areas of the palace that were set aside for the Janissaries, which were the elite guards of the Sultan. They had their own separate area as well where they were billeted. Um, but as I said, the harem was um, probably the most interesting and certainly the most private part of the palace. Only certain people were allowed to, um, to enter that. And I want to give you an idea of just how complicated the place was. This is one floor. Um, and you can see there are literally hundreds of rooms in this maze of different chambers. And there were several floors. Um, I forget the exact number, but I want to say it's somewhere in the four to 500 uh, rooms just in this part of the palace. And of course, it was limited only to the sultan, only to his wives and concubines, the Valid sultan, which was his mother, who occupied a very important um, position of power, um, and various princes and eunuchs. Um, but nobody else was allowed in this part of the palace. Um, but now you can visit and you can see all the 
um, incredible elaborate details, much of which you might think looks um, suspiciously European, and that's actually uh, quite deliberate, uh, particularly in the 19th century. Um, in the late 18th and early 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was uh, very deliberately trying to emulate what they saw as the power and prestige of places like the British Empire and Paris and uh, Prussia and so forth. So they um, adopted a number of the styles that are not terribly Eastern, like um, the kind of neoclassical paintings that you can see at the dome or this very Western style um, crystal chandelier. Um, a lot of that became very popular in, in Istanbul because they were trying to establish themselves as a peer um, on the same level of, of uh, power and prestige as the other European governments. And you can see quite a bit of that um, mixed with the uh, very distinct um, Eastern style of the rest of the palace. Um, this kind of um, demure little room <laughs> is um, has a much more um, unpleasant association to it. It's known as the circumcision chamber, which was a religious tradition for young princes um, at the time and, and even today. Um, young Turkish men are not circumcised at birth. They are circumcised as teenagers. Um, so it's, it's an important coming of age ceremony um, and um, that was done in this specific room for the princes of the Sultan. Um, and you can see all the way across, this is a, another of um, the other big mosque that we're going to visit in just a little bit down the river. Um, but on the completely opposite side of the social scale, um, this is the entrance to um, another one of the most um, popular parts of Istanbul to visit, which is the Grand Bazaar. Um, you can see the gate just in the back. Um, it's incredibly crowded um, and it's a whole lot of fun. That's the mosque just outside the entrance to it. When you get in the bazaar, um, which is quite old, uh, its construction started in the 15th century, and of all the big covered markets in cities around the world, it's one of the oldest and certainly one of the largest. Um, in 2014, which I think was the latest date I could find numbers for, over 90 million people visited this market. Um, inside there are over 3000 little um, shops and stalls and more than 60 of these little streets. Um, it's kind of fun to go in and get lost because um, if you keep walking, you're eventually going to find your way out. But in the meantime, um, it's just an amazing place to walk around. You will see um, things aimed at tourists. There's food, there's crafts, there's carpets, um, glassware, ceramics, you name it. But also a wide variety of things that um, ordinary citizens living in, in Istanbul would buy for themselves. It's not just for tourists. Um, so you'll find... Uh, clothing and shoes and uh, household items and all kinds of things like that. For me, one of the most enjoyable parts of, of markets in foreign countries is the food markets, um, just to see um, the wide variety of things that are often quite local. Um, here's, here's a great example where they have um, extremely hot chili for your mother-in-law, um, tea with Viagra in it, all kinds of things. And just walking around the streets um, and seeing uh, the mix of wealth and poverty mixed together, I, I found just um, incredibly fun. If you do shop in Istanbul, haggling is considered entirely appropriate. Um, there is kind of an art to it, so uh, you want to... Uh, 
probably do a little research to find out what's the etiquette about how to do that. Um, but the stated price is rarely what you would end up paying. And in fact, haggling is almost part of the enjoyment of the experience. Um, just on the outside of the market, this was um, a local kebab shop, which was incredibly popular. The wine went all the way around the block. Um, street life is very busy in a city like this. Um, you'll find uh, people, very often men, um, which you might not be surprised to hear, who are um, sitting, playing cards, playing backgammon, which is very popular, um, drinking tea or coffee, smoking their hookahs, and discussing the politics of the day. Because the city is such a maze of little streets, um, there's no way that you can get a FedEx truck, for example, down the street. So this is the way a lot of um, local deliveries are made. Um, the third of the really big mosques um, in the city is the Suleimani Mosque, um, a little further down, just beyond the, the stretch where the market is. Um, and this was an imperial mosque that was built also in the 16th century for Suleiman the Magnificent, who I mentioned was probably the, the most powerful of um, several centuries of sultans. Um, and physically, in terms of area, it is the largest mosque in the city uh, even today. And it was built by uh, Sinan the architect, who was a very important architect during that time period in the 16th century. And he built a whole lot of stuff. Um, for Suleiman, uh, both here and elsewhere in the empire. Um, and here you can see it from the outside. It's built quite high on a bluff overlooking the Golden Horn across to the other side of the city. And it has a beautiful courtyard. Um, and again, a very beautiful interior. Unlike the ones that we've seen uh, so far that had mosaics and, um, and tile work. This one, on the other hand, is almost completely painted. Everything that you see there is painting. And it still has its own unique style. Um, on the outside of almost every mosque, you will find places like this where um, observant Muslims will wash their feet um, before entering the building. You, as a visitor, you would not be expected to do this. Um, you would simply be expected to take off your shoes. Um, but observant Muslims do this as um, an important uh, religious act. And in addition to the mosque itself, um, like Hagia Sophia, there are a number of uh, important royal tombs here, including uh, the one for Suleiman himself, who you can see in this, this building, and his wife, Roxalana, who's buried next to him. Um, if you're interested in any kind of uh, history, um, there are a couple of really fascinating books about Roxalana and Suleiman, which um, are well worth reading if you want to get some background into the daily life and the politics and the intrigue um, of, of the royal court. Um, back in, in the 16th century. And also just outside um, where the tombs are, are these unusual headstones, which are typical of uh, all of the headstones that you'll see in cemeteries throughout Istanbul. Um, they have uh, obviously a completely different shape and style um, and iconography from what you would see in a Christian cemetery. Um, many of them even have turbans on the top, which often indicate a higher social standing of the person who died. Very atmospheric to walk around. And much more peaceful than the rest of the street, which looks like this, <laughs> or this, or this. Um, as you work your way down the hill towards the water, um, you can see this is, this is a very typical um, afternoon scene in, in Istanbul where everybody's out doing their shopping. Um, and it takes you to the other big market, which is um, a lot of fun to visit, which is um, the Spice Bazaar, 
Um, it's in an area right across from uh, a mosque that's known as the New Mosque, even though it was built in the late 17th century, um, a whole hundred years after all the others. Um, and this, this particular bazaar, it's not as big as the Grand Bazaar, but it's still huge. And um, it's completely devoted to food, which I find even more exciting than looking at Turkish carpets. There's endless amounts of coffee and Turkish delight and um, a lot of things, sweets that are made with um, pistachios and almonds and sesame seeds and um, honey and nougat, all kinds of things. Um, you'll find, um, of course, spices. In fact, they have 85 shops selling different kinds of spices, often displayed in these very beautiful arrangements. You can also buy perfumes. Dried flowers for sachets. Um, dried fruits and vegetables. You could spend all afternoon just wandering around here. Every kind of olive you could possibly want. And again, this, this looks out onto a big plaza that's right at the Golden Horn where this other mosque is, um, this new mosque, um, which I like because it, uh, it's, it's not as enclosed by, uh, by the rest of the city as some of the other mosques. So you can get a better idea of um, how it's constructed with all of these domes and half domes that um, are designed to support the weight of the central mosque. Uh, I'm sorry, the central dome in the middle of the mosque. Um, I'm not sure how many of you would remember this uh, reference, but the pudding shop um, is a very popular uh, place in Istanbul that opened way back in the late 50s. And for a long time, it was a popular place where counterculture expatriates would meet and tourists um, mostly in like the 60s and 70s. It was made very famous um, by having a, a role in the movie from 1978 called Midnight Express. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that, but um, the pudding shop is still there and you can still go eat there. Um, it's in one of the more touristy areas of the city. So you see a lot of this sort of thing around there as well. <laughs> Even cheaper than beer, you can get your name calligraphy. Um, but the city has all these beautiful details. Uh, this is that um, long uh, plaza that I was mentioning that's actually an old Roman hippodrome. The, the little... Um, sort of German looking, and it, it is in fact German. It was, it was donated by um, uh, a wealthy German uh, to the city it is unfortunately the location where um, probably the worst uh, terrorist attack in Istanbul in recent years took place. Um, I'm forgetting what year that was. I wanna say 2015 maybe, um, somewhere around there. And uh, a bomb was set off uh, very close to this monument and several uh, several people were killed, including foreign tourists, which did a real job on uh, the tourist market for Istanbul for the next couple of years. Um, most of what we, I have shown you um, so far has been, again, within a relatively small portion of the city that's maybe a 20-minute walk from one end to the other. It's, it's a fairly compact city in this area. And as the sun goes down, you just see the most beautiful. Um, unfortunately, some of the some of the beautiful sunsets come from the fact that there's a reasonable amount of air pollution um, in the area. But um, it makes for very nice sunsets over Hagia Sophia um, and also the Blue Mosque. And you can um, it's it's fun to treat yourself to a nice dinner way at the top, where you can watch um, watch the sun go down and um, they will light up. You'll, you'll hear the Moazines calling from the minarets and they light up all of the major downtown monuments. It's really spectacular. Um, even the Topkapi Palace gets lit up.
Um, as I mentioned, the food in Istanbul is great. I have no idea what roasting shepherd is, but I liked the sign. Um, and there's a lot of other interesting architecture to, to stumble on that isn't necessarily famous. This is the post office. Um, here's an old um, uh, bank, which I think is now a hotel. And it's just a very colorful city. Um, it's a feast for the eyes pretty much everywhere you turn. This is the area right across um, where you can see the Suleiman uh, Mosque up on the top of the hill. And we're at the Golden Horn, where um, that's a major cruise uh, ferry port and also for cruise ships. Uh, Istanbul is probably wouldn't come as any surprise that it's a major uh, cruise ship destination. And it's um, you, you would be remiss to visit Istanbul and not take at least one boat ride somewhere, um, even if it's not specifically a tourist trip. Um, just take the ordinary ferries, which don't cost very much, and you can uh, go up and down the river and get a little bit of a sense of what it's like to be um, an ordinary citizen in, in Istanbul that is so focused on the water. Um, the Galata Bridge that connects the oldest part of the city to um, the newer part of the city, which is more 19th century, I would say, 19th and 20th century. It's a two-level bridge. The, the bottom level is all fish restaurants, and you can walk uh, on that level. And then on the top is a, um, a vehicle, the, the vehicle level of the bridge, but also there are fishermen um, on both levels. The, this is actually the fourth of the Galata bridges uh, over, over time. Um, the, actually, I take that back. This is the fifth one. Fourth one um, is the one that burned in the 1990s. And in fact, I was there not long after um, it burned and it caused huge problems in the city because um, imagine if here in Boston, um, the Zakem Bridge had to be closed for a period of two or three years or Storrow Drive <laughs> had to be closed. It would cause immense traffic problems, which it did there because there was really no other easy way to get from one part of the city to the other. So the old bridge um, had a big fire and was largely destroyed. So they um, very reasonably quickly, given the circumstances, it only took two or three years, um, they rebuilt this new bridge, which has been there since then. And it's, um, it's nice even just to walk across because it gives you such a great view of the different parts of the city from, um, from across the water. The Galata side of Istanbul is much more modern, as you can see from here. Um, lots of high-rise, um, more recent buildings. Um, but it does have a certain amount of history, so it's worth, worth going there to visit. Um, this is the other big pedestrian, uh, I'm sorry, vehicle bridge that, that crosses it, not the Galata Bridge. Um, and it also has a metro crossing, which oddly has the metro station um, in between, not at one end or the other, but smack in the middle of the bridge, which is rather unusual. Um, we took one of the um, commuter ferries that can take you up the Golden Horn, um, where you can see a number of the sites in neighborhoods that tourists don't necessarily go to. This is actually uh, what's left of the old bridge. They floated it up the river, and it's been sitting there as a, a decrepit hulk ever since then. Um, there's also a fun museum of transportation, which if you have kids with you, um, would be a nice place to take. They have cars, they have boats, and even um, the submarine that you can see there is actually an American submarine. Um, we went to this area specifically to see uh, a very important um, monument for me um, as an architecture student, but it's a nice neighborhood to walk around, a mix of um, old buildings, new buildings, renovated buildings. Um, and you wouldn't think there's much to go see here. Very few tourists bother to go to this part of town. Um, but the reason I went there um, was to see an incredibly important uh, old church, which is built right against uh, the city walls. These are the medieval walls that you can see what's left of them um, in this part of the town. Um, but this 
this building, which this is not my photograph, because unfortunately, while I was there, it was completely covered with scaffolding for renovation. But I wanted you to see what the building looks like. Um, this is called the Chora Church, um, what it would look like if it didn't have scaffolding all over it. And it's another one of the most important Byzantine monuments if you are interested in that kind of art um, and time period. The original church um, reflects the fact um, that it was built outside the original walls of the old city. And Chora is uh, an old Greek word meaning village. Um, and that was the idea. This was a church that was built outside the, um, the boundary of the central city. Um, so it's very old. Fifth, we're talking fifth century. That's um, 1,500 years old, this building is. Um, parts of it are that old. Much of what you see is actually later from like the 11th century, but we're still talking uh, about a very, very old building. And it has um, some of the world's best Byzantine mosaics and also frescoes, um, which you can see here. It's a, it's a small building. This is nowhere near as massive as any of the mosques or Hagia Sophia like we've seen so far. It's a much more intimate building. Um, and the main body of the church is completely covered with um, superb mosaics with gold um, and precious stones um, in really incredible condition. On the right-hand side of this um, photograph, what you're seeing are um, some of the frescoes, which is painting um, as opposed to mosaics. But they really are uh, in unbelievable condition given their age. And there is hardly a square inch in the building that does not have some um, incredibly detailed artwork on it. Um, like Hagia Sophia, last year this was another of the um, cultural monuments uh, that was taken by the Erdogan government um, and reconverted into a uh, mosque. Um, for religious services, even though this uh, is clearly a Christian church. And that, of course, like with Hagia Sophia, which is a better known monument, caused great consternation in the art world um, and with UNESCO and a variety of other um, places around the world. So we'll see whether what, what happens. Um, but again, like with Hagia Sophia, regardless of the official status of the building, it is still a place that you can go visit. Um, it doesn't prevent people from seeing it. Um, unbelievable detail. And to think that these mosaics are close to a thousand years old. So if you are at all interested in this kind of art um, or just very beautiful art in general, um, it's uh, kind of on the outskirts of the city and not on the, it's not one of the top attractions um, that many people tend to visit, but I would highly recommend going there because it's just, it's mind-bogglingly beautiful. Um, right around the corner, this is not mind-bogglingly mind -bogglingly beautiful. This is just some of the surrounding area with lots of um, uh, TV dishes. Um, going back towards the center of town, here's the Galata Bridge that shows uh, you can more clearly see the upper and lower levels where people are fishing, but the entire bottom level is all fish restaurants, the entire length of the bridge. Now, if we cross to the other side, um, the more modern part of the city, which was built up in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, um, has some fascinating places too. Um, this is one of the few synagogues in the city. And probably the big thing to see there is the Galata Tower, which was built um, not by the Ottomans, surprisingly, it was built by the Genoese. Um, and it's a 200 foot tower that was built in the 14th century uh, for protection in this part of the city. Um, and probably the, the most fun thing to do is to stroll uh, Istanbul's equivalent of Nubra Street. This is the big shopping street and it's completely pedestrianized. Um, it's called Ind Independent Street, Istiklal. Um, and it's probably a mile long, at least, um, all the way to Taksim Square, which is the big modern square where um, political demonstrations might happen, and so forth. Um, but it's, it's just one store after another. There are a lot of interesting little alcoves, restaurants. There's an old um, 
uh, the original antique trolley that runs up and down the street. There's also quite a few of these old style gallerias um, that have small shops and um, stained glass. They're just all these beautiful nooks and crannies to, to stroll along. And no, unlike the rest of um, many parts of Istanbul, there's no traffic. When you get to the end, uh, you come out into Taksim Square, which is rather new and not terribly attractive. It's surrounded by big, ugly new buildings, um, but it's important because it's the political heart of the modern city. Um, this is the Monument of the Republic from 1928 um, that celebrates Turkey as a secular 20th century nation rising from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. So if you are ever um, watching the news and you hear about a big demonstration that takes place in Istanbul um, for any reason, it's very likely that this is where it's happening. Um, but um, it's not one of the more attractive parts of the city, but it is kind of interesting to see modern Istanbul from that perspective. And there are some nice areas around it that have parks. Um, here's one of the not terribly attractive modern hotels. So if you're, if you're only in Istanbul for a short time, I don't know if I put this high on your list, um, but it's worth it to get a feel for Istanbul, not as a historic city, but one that is very much alive today with its own politics to deal with. Um, another interesting site that's worth stopping in um, or staying in, if you can afford it, is the Para Palace Hotel, which is a very famous hotel in the city from the late 19th century. Um, it was for a long time the terminus of the Orient Express. So a lot of people who took the Orient Express during that time um, stayed here when they got to Istanbul. People like Agatha Christie and Winston Churchill and Greta Garbo and all that kind of crowd. Um, and it's a gorgeous grand hotel like you would see in many other um, European cities. Um, it's, it was built in 1895 and was important in, um, in Istanbul at the time because it was the very first building anywhere in the city to have electricity um, and hot running water. Um, it even had an electric elevator, which you can see on the right. Um, and the decoration inside is, is, again, an interesting mix of um, the exotic East, but also um, traditional Western European luxury. So if you don't stay there, um, because it is very much an expensive luxury hotel, um, it's still perfectly possible to go in and have tea or eat in the restaurant um, or just wander around the public rooms um, to get a feel for the glamour of the, the old times. This is the little tea shop. I can also recommend a book if you um, would like to know a little bit more about it. There is a book that was published a few years ago called Midnight at the Para Palace, um, which is by an author named Charles King. And um, it's, I, I really enjoyed it because it's more of a social history. Um, there's not quite as much about the politics and the wars and so forth. It's more about uh, the daily life and the interesting intrigue and social history um, of Istanbul developing from the end of the Ottoman Empire coming into the 20th century. Um, another thing that I would very much recommend that you do if you have an opportunity is to go to um, a, a dervish ceremony and you will find a lot of tacky dervish um, stuff that you can see at restaurants and, and so forth along with belly dancing and other um, very touristy things. But dervishes are actually um, a very serious um, religious, um, religious practitioners, and there are a few places left where you can see them. This is the oldest of the six that remain in the city. This was built in 1491 um, and is a beautiful old, another typical wooden building with a cemetery around it. And you often have to book these uh, ahead of time if you want to uh, take part and observe one of the ceremonies. Um, this is, it's a lot, what they call a lodge. Um, and the whirling dervishes are part of the Sufi branch 
of uh, the Muslim religion, which for a very long time um, in Turkey was officially banned, but was allowed to continue as what they called a cultural exhibition. So as long as they treated it as just dancing for the tourists, it was allowed to continue. Um, the ban has been lifted. So in recent years, um, Sufis are going back to doing uh, dervish um, displays as the original traditional um, religious ceremony that it was. And um, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's, it's an incredibly powerful thing to see. It involves prayer and music and dance, which is what most people associate with it. Um, and they, um, they do the one that we went to, I thought did a pretty decent job kind of explaining the symbolism um, of the, the whirling dance, which symbolizes a lot of circular things in the world, the cycle of the seasons, the cycle of birth and death, um, how the planets and the sun and the moon revolve. So everything is circular um, in their worldview. And the dance is a symbolic representation of that. Um, you might think it isn't very difficult until you try. Um, they will literally twirl, like you see here, um, for five to 10 minutes at a time. And um, after this presentation is over, um, give it a shot <laughs> in the privacy of your own home and see if you can do it for more than 15 seconds without falling over and hitting your head. It's, it's something that they train for years to do. Um, and um, they actually explain the, the different levels. It's almost like a monastery where um, novices come in and are trained slowly um, before they're allowed to participate at the higher levels. Um, so if you are ever there, don't do one of the dervish, um, you know, the, the ones that you see at a, at a Turkish restaurant in the tourist district. Uh, make a point to reserve ahead of time to actually go to a genuine uh, Sufi der dervish lodge. Um, and you'll find it's a, it's a very moving religious experience um, to understand something that's a, a spirituality that is so different from um, any of the ones in our own culture. Here's the Topkapi Palace across the Golden Horn, just some beautiful views of the city. Um, I'd also, uh, like I said, encourage you to kind of walk, wander around because you'll see all kinds of interesting things in the nooks and crannies of the city. I loved this candy striped mosque that's not a terribly well known one. It's just pretty. Um, here's the main train station in the town. Um, and explore the other neighborhoods of the city. If you go up north, um, along the Bosphorus, you'll find the area where all the cruise ships dock, and you can get nice views back. Um, and also take, um, take a trip across the river. The area across the Bosphorus is called Uskudar, and it has a very nice neighborhood feel. There's no major tourist attractions there. Um, almost the best part of it is the view back to the main city, but there are some lovely mosques. Um, it has a very nice kind of local feel to it. It's kind of like going to East Boston, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty neighborhood, um, and you just get a spectacular view back to the city. Um, there's some great fish markets over there. And um, actually, unlike some other parts of the city, there's a huge promenade that goes all the way around that whole neighborhood. Um, so you can walk a good mile or two up and down the Bosphorus um, and get great views the whole way and see the daily life of what families are doing of an afternoon, and so forth. Um, you also get a closer up view of an interesting site that's um, closer to this side called the Maiden's Tower, sometimes called Leander's Tower, which was built in 1110. Um, and there, or at least there has been something on this little rock since that time period. What you see now is a more recent reconstruction from the 1700s. Um, and there's a legend about this tower that says that the emperor had his daughter imprisoned there um, to avoid, because he had heard a prophecy that she was going to be killed by a snake on her 18th birthday. So to protect her, 
he um, imprisoned her temporarily on this little island. Um, but she died anyway, because on her birthday, he brought her a basket of fruit. And unbeknownst to him, there was a deadly snake in the basket of fruit, and it bit her and she died. So this is all, of course, completely apocryphal, but it makes a great story. And um, the other famous legend that is associated with it is um, Hero and Leander, who died swimming um, the Hellspont, or what is now called the Dardanelles, to be with his beloved. Um, and nowadays, despite all of these um, elaborate and um, impressive ancient legends, really what it's used for is a place where you can get a really expensive lunch or... Um, if you want, you can um, pay even more money and get married there. It's a wedding venue um, for wealthy Turks, um, but it is a nice photo. And you also get a beautiful view back over to this palace, the Dolmabache Palace, which has about 300 rooms. And you, if you remember, I mentioned a little bit earlier that there was a time period where um, the Ottomans were very uh, deliberately trying to emulate um, Western Europe. And this was probably the high point of that. This palace was specifically designed to rival Versailles um, in a very uh, distinctly European style. I don't think it was as successful as they would like to think it is, um, but it is interesting to see. Um, it's a quarter mile long. Um, it is full of Baccarat crystal chandeliers. Um, in fact, the grand staircase, the entire um, staircase is made of Baccarat crystal. Um, that's how hard they were trying to be like the French. <laughs> um, and in fact, it has um, the one superlative that it does have is um, the, the great hall, which you can kind of see. Take you back here. This, this big thing here in the middle is one great big single room. And when they had events in that room, they actually had to start um, as much as a week ahead of time heating it because it was such a big room that it took that long to heat. Um, so it's kind of an interesting place to visit if you like over-the-top um, palaces. Um, and um, even if you don't visit it, you can stroll along the outside and it makes a, a nice area to walk around the city. The other thing it's famous for is that Ataturk, Kamal Ataturk, who is so famous for bringing uh, Turkey into the 20th century, um, died in the, in the palace in 1938. And you can see the room where he died. Um, the palace has its own mosque and its own um, quite Baroque uh, clock tower as well. Um, just some more scenes of the city. This is Istanbul University. Um, and here's a Turkish toilet. Um, <laughs> I need to emphasize that although Turkish toilets exist all over the world and I'm not entirely sure whether they started in Turkey or that's just how they got their name. Um, but if you travel there, have no fear. Pretty much every place you go is going to have a perfectly normal Western toilet. Um, the nice thing about Turkish toilets, though, is they're actually quite um, well thought out. They are designed much more ergonomically for the way human beings are supposed to go to the bathroom. Um, and you don't have, you hover, you don't sit, so you don't get dirty. And so there's actually a lot of very good sense about them. But um, if you stay in any uh, hotel or guest house in, um, in downtown Istanbul, I assure you, you are going to have a toilet that's exactly like the one that you have at home. Um, another of the, the big mosques built for one of Suleiman's princes, he had his own mosque. Again, with some very beautiful interiors. Um, there was a, um, because this is such an old city, going back to um, even Roman times, there's a huge aqueduct that brought water from outside the city um, into the cisterns. There's some more modern um, 20th century monuments. And I'm going to finish by um, taking you to one last mosque that you will almost never go to. Hardly anybody goes to this part of the city because it's way out by the walls. Um, this is called the Fatih Mosque, and it's in um, a fairly conservative um, western neighborhood of the city, way, way out on the west side of the city. Um, and it was the first of the imperial mosques that was built in the very late 1400s, so it's much 
older than some of the other ones that we've seen. Um, here are some uh, people washing their feet to go in. And again, the interior is just mind blowing. <laughs> like, you'll notice that um, there are Turkish carpets also throughout um, all of these mosques. Um, in fact, multiple layers of them because it makes it easier to walk on. And a cemetery like every other, um, think of it almost like uh, most Western cathedrals that you would visit in Europe often have a cemetery associated with them and the same is true of mosques. And it's a nice neighborhood because again, you'll probably be the only tourists walking around and you'll just get a chance to see the locals drinking tea, um, some beautiful uh, fancy buildings, local buildings, not fancy buildings. I love this photograph where I was just walking down a street and I happened to turn and look down an alley and saw this just beautiful little tableau of daily life in the city. And then of course, um, so much else is based on Tur uh, Turkey and Istanbul being the financial engine of it. Um, it's, it's an incredibly important city, not just for tourism, but for trade, for shipping. Um, it's, it's one of the world's great cities. Um, and if you ever have an opportunity to go there, even if it's just as, um, it's often the starting point for a number of Mediterranean cruises. So even if you can only go there for like a day or two, um, do find a way to get there because I think you'll find it's one of your favorite places once you go. So I'm gonna end there. And I will stop my screen share. And, and I just before we turn it over to questions, Jeff, yep. I just wanted to um, briefly say um, that we wanted to thank the friends for supporting programs like this. It's because of them that we're able to have this kind of programming. So we want to say thank you to the friends of the library. Um, but I also wanted to mention that... Um, Carrie has just popped a link to a survey into the chat box. It would be very helpful to us um, if you would uh, click that link and complete the survey. It is very quick. It is just a few questions, but it would really help us going forward. So we really appreciate that. Um, as to asking questions, if people are comfortable, they can put them in the chat, but they can also just unmute themselves if they have a question to ask yeah. since we're not a very large group tonight. Yeah, um, so, so I'll... Um, I'll see if anybody has a question. I'm going to be monitoring the chat. Um, I will also put in, um, it was on my um, last slide, but I'm, I closed that. So I will also put my email in if you have any um, other questions that you think of later, or you just want to ask me advice about traveling or whatever, uh, do feel free. I'm happy to take questions from anybody anytime. Has anyone been to Istanbul? Very quiet group. <laughs> I have. Uh, oh. I have oh, good. A oh. couple people have. Yeah, there we go. Uh, am I on? Great, thanks. Yes. Yep. Uh, my wife and I were there in, uh, was it 2012? 2012. 2012. Okay. We absolutely loved it. We were doing what you said at the end. We were going to start a cruise there. And so we stayed a day and a half or so and wish we could have three been days there. three days yeah. Oh, yeah wish we could have been there longer and uh we saw many of the things you went through tonight and enjoyed your talk very much thank you uh, since then i have a friend uh, a business friend and he said his son went there on business uh after we went there maybe five or six years maybe 2020 2017 and he said there were so many beggars on the street that he couldn't move because they were refugees, of course, and in difficult straits. And for him, it, it didn't make a good uh, a visit. And yeah. I wonder if that's still the situation. I was there before that as well. Uh, certainly uh, two, well, two or three main things have happened. My, my general experience in the times that I've been there is that was not much of a problem, certainly no more so than any other city I've been to. Yes. But as you said, things have really changed recently because the situation in Syria yes. and Iraq mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
And now I can imagine that's going to continue because now we have Afghanistan. So the flood of refugees coming from the east, um, trying to get anywhere in Europe, um, yes. many of them are heading as, as quick as they can to Germany and places like that. Um, but uh, Turkey is um, really on the front lines of that, as is Greece and Bulgaria and yes. Romania. All of those countries, just by virtue of geography, um, are having a very difficult time. And uh, the situation with Turkey is awkward because at least the other countries are uh, either members of the European Union or um, in the process of becoming uh, members of the European Union, whereas Turkey is still on the other side of the border mm. uh, politically. So um, there's a lot of conflict um, in terms of how well those different political entities cooperate with each other in dealing with a crisis like this. Um, and Erdogan has certainly not helped. Um, <laughs> right. he, he is not doing Turkey any favors Yes, uh, in terms of uh, making it uh, easier to deal with on the international stage. Right. Um, so, uh, like I said, when, when I was there last, which was maybe five, six years ago, I forget. Um, but we, we did not notice any of that. But a oh, lot okay. of that has definitely happened since, uh, yeah, definitely since 2015, it's gotten, um, gotten worse. And I would not be surprised if it's much more noticeable as you're walking around. I see. But it wouldn't prevent you from returning if you could, would it? Not at all. No, I don't think it prevents us. <laughs> the opportunity would be there, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. The last and, time I was there, um, the people I talked to really didn't like Erdogan at all. Hmm. Yeah. He's it, not very popular. He's not very popular, but it is also not very easy to criticize him. Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> Without getting into a lot of trouble, so yeah, it's a it's a very it, it's a very bad situation. Um, he started out by being okay, and then like you have just seeing like every year it gets just slightly worse, and um, he gets away with every year he gets away with a little bit more, and now it's it's bad. Um, yeah, and. Um, who, who knows where it's going to head. However, um, Turkey and certainly Istanbul relies very heavily on tourism. So um, they're at least aware of the fact that they may only be able to push certain things so far before it really um, starts to backfire on them. Right. But yeah. And Jeff, we've got a few questions coming in from YouTube in sure. the chat. Um, so the first one is, what are the best options for getting around? I know you mentioned foot, but if you uh, can't walk. Um, to getting around in uh, in the city, uh, like I said, on foot is the easiest. And there's a very inexpensive and uh, pretty extensive public transit system. The, the, the metro um, is good for longer distances. Okay. Um, it easily goes to the airport. It's very fast. Um, there are buses and trams on the street level. Um, that um, take you around the city. It's, yeah, it's very easy to get around. Absolutely do not drive a car. <laughs> <laughs> um, and somebody has a question, is it a problem to photograph people there? Um, is that a cultural taboo? It's, um, I would say no more so than a lot of other countries. Um, I would be careful photographing people in Quincy. You know, <laughs> I think you have to, um, particularly now, you know, I think people are more conscious of privacy and, creepy people on the street with cameras <laughs> than they were 20 years ago. Um, I, I would say it's kind of a mix of, um, because it's a huge city with literally millions of people on the street, it's not hard to take a photograph of people on the street without looking like you're, you know, if you were really wanting to take a picture of a specific individual I think it's polite to ask, and I think that would be true in France or here. Uh, I, I don't think it's any necessarily any worse there. Mm -hmm. um, if I were in a small village in Turkey, yeah, it would be different. I, but is, I, Istanbul I is a big in A lot of small villages, and I traveled in Istanbul, and I didn't have any problem at all yeah. 
taking photos of people and I yeah. do photography, so mm-hmm. I yeah. was taking a lot of photos. It wasn't a problem. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think of it as a problem. But I ask. I, yeah. I do ask. I, I, it's, always, it's always just polite, mm-hmm. um, particularly if you're taking women, like, one person. A lot of women in the hajib or something mm. prefer not. Mm. Yeah. Or you can do what I do is have a telephoto and surreptitiously take a picture of something else. That, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get good at that kind of thing. And Jeff, this is a very specific question, but somebody wants to know, are the Grand Bazaar and the Spice Market in the same spot? No, um, but they are not far apart. They're okay. probably, I don't know, a 10, 15 minute walk from each other. Um, they're in the same general part of the city, but they're not right next to each other. Next to each other. Yeah. And then the last one in the chat is, um, is it easy to purchase things there and send them back to the USA? Oh, God, yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard not to. (laughs) Especially rugs. Yes, they will. um, Yeah, this uh, Istanbul is all about um, buying stuff. (laughs) Yeah. they are they are very happy to sell you anything and they will ship it anywhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> not a problem um, in fact i the thing that amazed me the most when i was there the first time actually this is back like way in the 90s um i was there with a friend and we were talking to we were i think it was a rug shop um and the owner of the rug shop had left for lunch or to run an errand or something. And he had left the shop um, in the charge of his like 12, 13 year old son. And that kid could speak English, French, Turkish, German, Italian, Greek, Spanish. Like it was incredible how many, like it, it, it was just amazing. I mean, obviously not fluently, but enough to be able to sell somebody something. Yep. Um, they, they are so well equipped to be able to interact with, uh, you know, and that's not new. This is, Istanbul has been that way for 2000 years. So yeah, it's, um, and most people are very friendly. And if you don't take the whole, if you don't take all that stuff seriously, it's easy to get annoyed by having people constantly want you to buy stuff if you just enjoy it and you know it, it's actually kind of fun and then um any idea how the conversion of um, Hagia Sophia to a mosque will change tourism there um from what my understanding is um uh and this is only from reading articles about when it happened last year um there are no plans to change to prohibit um tourists from going there they'd be crazy to like the biggest thing to see in the city. Um, however, it would make it more like the other mosques, where unlike being able to walk in and treat it as a museum, um, instead it would be treated like the other mosques, where there would be certain times of day during prayer times when it would be closed. There would be um, um, you would be expected to follow the same kinds of rules that apply to other mosques: take off your shoes women would be expected to wear a headscarf, which they will give you if you don't have one. Um, So um, I I think in the political, on the political side, it's extremely upsetting to cultural entities around the world. And and as I said, a lot of Turks who saw it as a symbol of Turkey being more open to the non-Islamic world. so it it was very much seen as something that the government, the current government, was doing to play to his conservative base. Um, and uh, but I have not seen any indication that either that or the horror church that I showed you are in any way off limits to people who want to go visit them. Yeah. Um, and yes, I love Turkish delight, and I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody so else? Said, so do they have, so they have a separate currency. They're not. Um, um, Turkey is still, oh, lira. that's a good question. No. Yes, they are. They are. They're using the lira because they are not part of the EU. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of those countries, I did a Danube cruise a couple years ago. Yeah. And they're, they're 
in the European Union, but they're not in the but Euro. They're not using the Euro, Euro. exactly. Yeah. Not using Euro, um, so every place you went, you you you're there for a day, and you had to put a different currency if you weren't yeah, using exactly. credit cards. Yeah. Um, tur <laughs> yeah. Turkey has, uh, for like the past twenty years, there have been little discussions about whether it would be a good idea to start accession talks to the EU, and um, that. With like, the current guy, nah. Yeah, uh, like 20 years ago, that sounded like, well, let's think about it and see where it goes. And then now I think the chances are pretty close to zero. <laughs> Nobody's happy about it. I don't think it's going to happen now. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Thank you very much. This was Thanks. Thank you. Was great. Thank right you on. very, very much, Jeff. We really appreciate it. I, I learned a ton. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, uh, great I've questions. got my eye on a Black Sea cruise, so I am. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> my, I guess my uh, a couple places on the, uh, Romania my, and Bulgaria. Yeah, yeah. R Romania, uh, Romania is gorgeous. I was there for a couple of weeks uh, five years ago, six yeah. years ago. Yeah, we I've drove, we before, drove all the way around Romania. It's like I really yeah. like Bulgaria, oh, yeah. too. Though. I was there on that last trip. And yeah. Yeah, very interesting country. So yeah. and, and I could knock off Ukraine if I at least get to Odessa. <laughs> yeah, I, I I actually was um, planning a trip to Ukraine and then um, with absolutely no thought of me at all, Putin went in and invaded Crimea and <laughs> <laughs> the nerve. But uh, yeah, so... <laughs> um, but uh, another place in that area that I would love to go Hopefully in the next, I don't know, maybe two or three years, I really want to go to Georgia, um, which is on the other, the far eastern side of the Black Sea. And yeah, so, I've been to I've been to Sochi, and the airport to Sochi is practically yeah, in Georgia. In Georgia, but, Georgia, so that yeah. that's a big trip that I've been planning for a while. So I hope to get there sometime in the next couple of years, maybe. Mm -hmm.